algebraic pass category. In algebra, there is a pass category where you just take the arrows and you compose the whole arrows. But here you really go in the, into the middle of the arrows and you really make something continuous. Of course, these classical paths are a part of these new continuous ones because they are just a special case of those which start at the vertices and end at vertices. Okay, so that means the following that these are just mathematical uh, uh, facts, but I think it's interesting to have such, you know, uh, theories at your hand, which then can be used in practice. So you, uh, of course, uh, ha have this inclusion of the paths into the continuous paths, and then when you take a gesture, which is something from the continuous path to a, to a topological category X, you can restrict, right, the, the map to the, classical algebraic paths, so you can ge generate from a gesture a process just by restricting to these uh, black arrows. So you can go up from the gesture to a process. And we see in a moment how we can define processes by finger gesture. Now this is the real classical thing that we really want to work concretely and not just looking at strange mathematical formulas, right? The converse is also possible. You can create gestures from process diagrams. So when you have a, a process diagrams, the diagram, you can also extend it continuously and we all, uh, shall see that how it, how it works. Uh, using the Bruja decomposition. Okay, so uh, our, our finger gestures, which are now being implemented by Florian Talman at the University of Minnesota, uh, work like this, that you have a hand, you have three fingers, every finger on the, on the trackpad. I mean, these are very elementary, two-dimensional uh, gestures. You can imagine that you generalize that to, I don't know, two hands and three dimensions. But I think the principle is uh, kind of evident here. You have three positions, starting position of, of the fingers, and the, then you move your fingers somewhere else. You see these big uh, gray arrows here. And then the end, the end position defines four uh, vectors which then define um, co elements of general two-dimensional transformation, namely translation, del dilation, rotation, shearing, and reflection. So you can do all those things with these three fingers, right? And this is being implemented, as I say, presently by Florian Talman. Okay? And the other one, the converse transformation, namely from abstract transformations to gestures is uh, managed as follows. I just show the, the two-dimensional situation here. If you have uh, any, any transformation which has positive determinant in two dimensions, then there is a process which has been described by algebraists, which is called Bruja decomposition, where you reduce the, un the understanding of F to a, a sequence of functions, which or matrices in this case, which are very standard uh, 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 transformations. You see here what you get, uh, we, we don't have to look at the details, but you see here, you decompose this F into uh, a shearing and, and dilation and rotation. So what is the interesting thing here? I, I don't know where you are aware that mathematicians are liars. They, they really they, they cheat you because what are they doing? When they are describing functions, what do they make? You know, the, Frege, the Fregean tradition is you have domain X, you have an arrow, and the codomain Y, right? You have an arrow from X to Y. Yes, but this arrow is a complete lie, because the arrow is, 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 is not true. I mean, there is nothing in the middle, right? It's a teleportation. You have an x, and then you have a function value, f of x, and there is nothing in between, right? So the arrow is kind of an intuitive thing, but it, it, it doesn't exist, right? There are many, uh, you know, transformations in matrices which look like algebraic things, but there's no arrow, there's nothing between. There are special arrows, special transformations which are really kind of intuitively movements, and this is, for example, the rotation, right? If you have a rotation from here to here, you know, you can move from the identity to the result, right? That's a nice gesture. There is also, if you have the shearing, shearing, you know, the shearing like this, this is the arpeggio music, right? The shearing, you can also nicely move from the identity to the shearing. And also, uh, any rotation, you know, uh, and, and dilata dilation also. These are things where you really have a movement. And what I, we are doing here with the Bruja is to take an abstract matrix in GL plus of 2AR and kind of represent it 
as, as a movement of gestural nature, yes? So this is, I think, an important thing. We can represent these transformations as gestural objects. Okay, this is what we are implementing. And uh, we are implementing it in the so-called Big Bang Roubaix. Well, uh, he calls it Big Bang. It's Florian Dalma. He's a computer scientist and works with me in Minnesota. And it's part of the Rubata music software. So the software uh, looks more or less like this. I, I'm going to show something. I don't know. Do I have some time? A few minutes. A few minutes, yeah, yeah. So that I can do that. And the software has been described in the book, the Roboto Composer Music Software, which has been published uh, at Springer. And it's written by Gerard Milmeister, who has done the, his PhD on this software. OK, so let's look at this software here. Uh, where, where are you? Uh, yes. OK, what I have here, I, I'm very short here, right? So that's not the state which we want. That's kind of something I think is important, which is still abstract. To me, it's kind of a, a, in the middle between formulas and gestures. And what we are doing now is to transform this thing into real gestures with the fingers, right? So what you see here, oh my god, this is, where are you here? Hey, come on. OK, L lion, I, I like lion very much, but sometimes it's kind of. Mysterious. <laughs> okay, so kind of the magic is coming back. Okay, so this is one of these things here. I have loaded a, um, a short Chopin piece. In. The sound is horrible, but just forget it. You see, there is the pitch and the time here. So what I can do, I can of course select some of these things here. I select all of it here, and then I can uh, translate it. So I take one here, and then I can, when I play it, it's just always played at the state where I stop. So you see, every time I stop my movement, it just plays it. Okay, so, um, so let's go to the, let's make the rotation here. No, uh, first, a uh, reflection. Let's make a horizontal reflection. This is inversion, of course, you know that. OK. OK, let's make a vertical reflection here, which is, of course, a retrograde. OK. You see, it always plays it. OK, and now let's make a rotation here. So you see, I always have to specify which movement I have. And then I have a kind of a gesture on, on my, ah, this is this bad surface here. You see, I can listen to it. If I don't like it, I say, no, please move somewhere else. Yeah, so let it be like this. But I think that the succession is not so good. Let's just make a shearing here. You see, I can make a shearing of this piece here. I don't like it. Let's make it more like this. OK. And then I can also, because it's too large here, I can make a kind of scaling. You see, I can put the, the whole piece now small or kind of Okay, and uh, let's load it again. I'm nearly finished, huh? I'm nearly finished. Uh, I can also uh, alter it, which means I can deform it. So I can deform it just def defining two uh, points of attraction, like this one and this one here. And then I can go to the alteration. I just look at the first part here and the, the second part here. So the sec these points to the right are attractive points. And you will see if I, hey, where are you here? It's time. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Does it work? Oh, I didn't. This didn't work. Sorry. I have to select it once again. OK, I think now it should work. Huh? This is black, and this is yes. OK, now you see I can deform it. So the attraction. Uh, 
Or you can also track at the end here. And the objects, can they be other sorts of things besides just the pitch? pitch uh, oh, they have pitch, they have time, they, they have duration, they have uh, loudness, or yeah. the, and, and the voice. And okay. you can attract, you can deform this in any uh, of the, the uh, planes which you did. You can choose which choose parameters point, yeah. you take, yes. I mean, could you generalize it and use it just for parameters? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's, that's no problem. So you see, you can deform things here. And I w would like to make this with my fingers, not, or not just with the mouse. But you see the idea. We'll make an interface for you. And, uh, <laughs> and wait, I'm just, I'm nearly finished. You can also go, oh, wait, of course you can select everything. Ah, oh, I hate this. I cannot hear it anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Delete it. Okay, but I can do, I can also draw things here. I hate Chopa. Uh, you can draw something, and then you can make a, what we call wallpaper. So you select this set here, right? And then you, you define a wallpaper, which means you define a repetition, for example, by translation. You translate that, and you get. You see what I make here? But I can also add a rotation, right? So that means translation plus a rotation. This is generalized wallpapers. And I can add a second dimension and then translate it again so I can make some kind of a two-dimensional. Okay. And if I'm finished with that, I, of course, can select that and make any kind of rotation I like. You know? So this is kind of the, the general setup. But I think what we want is really to do this with, with gestures, yeah. not with kind of this semi-gestural mathematical formulas. So really what it, how does it connect to the outside? Does it send MIDI or? Something? Yeah, it, yes, it's, it sends MIDI. But I think, it, it, well, I, I'm not talking yeah. about that. We can also make uh, frequency modulation on the same on the same principle. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this sound is just you should forget it. Yeah. Just the principle. Yeah. I think I'm done here. Thank you. Well. I call it the inside out trombone. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's mostly just a kind of provocative metaphor at the beginning, at the first level, because it, it strikes me, because it's got a geometrical component. Uh, this, this, I forget, this room has really lousy acoustics. Yeah, it's amazing. Ah, that's right. Oh, for those of you outside, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forget about the uh, action at a distance aspect of our reality. Now. Um, but it, it's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor for me, which is very, a very, very strong one, because it, 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 it has, um, well, I'll just go through them. It has a lot of connections to the practice of musical instrument making. The first one is, is to, just to be controversial, to remind people that instrument making is not interface building. Okay. The music instrument is not an interface, because what's it interface to? To air, to music, to the history of music, to, you know, certainly interfaces are about connecting parameters outside the computer, I mean inside the computer to outside the computer. It's a very, it's a very different world than what it is we do in music, because it's not clear what the music is. You know, when you, you know, it's not clear to the person who even makes the instrument what the music's going to be until they begin playing. And, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's an abstract way of saying it, because in fact you have a history. You, you, know, you learn to play this, this instrument, you were not happy with it, and some way you want to change the instrument. And um, for me, the trombone, maybe I have a history because I have a good friend who's a trombone player, um, who's a fabulous trombone player, and to me it's a kind of archetypal instrument because, as George Lewis says, my friend, it's a joke instrument. It's a silly, simple little instrument. There's almost nothing to it. And yet, for me, it represents an awful lot of history. It represents um, the, uh, another story, which we haven't got time to talk about, the, the influence of metallurgy on musical technology. In other words, sometime 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, we discovered metals, and we discovered that they had extraordinary properties. I mean, just think about the way in which sound lives inside metal, which it doesn't do, obviously, in a lot of other sort of natural materials. And the discovery of metal revealed to us, just in the way electronics and computers have revealed to us, this incredible matrix or material realm of possibility for sound. And um, so for me, the, I just 
keep it around because I like this kind of Bronze Age idea, and I have a lot to talk about that some other time. But um, the other idea is that is that the 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 trombone looks like a computer instrument device in some way because it's a slide. Forgetting about the really beautiful part of the trombone in the opera sure for a while. Just think about it as a slider, which is which is the obvious thing that everybody sees from the, from the audience and why it's a joke instrument. Um, it's really just a one-dimensional controller, just like the kind of little slides we all have in computer music. And I'm, this, is, this is meant to address computer musicians. Obviously, the musicians last night don't have a problem uh, with this. Um, but um, the problem is, is that of course, the, the the parameter you're controlling, which in the case of the trombone is the length of the tube, um, which controls pitch because of resonance and all sorts of things you must know about already, um, is not the actual way in which the trombone is for us, is for us musicians, I mean, as the trombone player said. It's not how it exists. If you think about it, the trombone is embraced in, you might say, a, what in physics we'd call like a seventh, um, seven degree system or um, a seven degrees of freedom system. Okay, there's so many things you could, as you hold the trombone, you, you can move your wrist, you can move your elbow, you can move your shoulder. Ro I learned a lot of this from robotics people because they're trying, of course, to make robots that can do the kinds of things we do. And the reason seven degrees of freedom is interesting in robotics is because what we've evolved, and this is something that's come to us through evolution, is the ability to reach around things. So in order to be able to do one thing, we have millions of different ways that we can do one thing. Okay? We can reach for this in many, many different ways. And the reason for that is you might say, um, from a survival point of view, if something is in your way, you don't want to have to be blocked from whatever beautiful piece of fruit over here or enemy that you want to uh, protect yourself from. So this is something very practical. But it means that we have this incredibly redundant representational system in the human bodily sense. And even though the trombone only has this one degree of control, we embrace it in a system which has lots of degrees of control. Think about how many muscles and nerve co connections that have to be made to be able to do this gesture, this beautiful kind of gesture that trombone players can do. And which is, is interesting because it's a bit of an embarrassing gesture because perhaps music doesn't like the freedom the trombone has. In a certain sense, there's a resistance to the freedom that's so implicit in a trombone. And uh, so for me, the reason that's important is because making a, a computer interface type instrument is often seen as a very practical, simple sort of thing. Something kind of like a straight line. You have this parameter here, you want to link it to something out here that's in the physical world, there's something in here that's in this kind of virtual world of, of representations of mathematics, of, of uh, you know, synthesis, of samples in a row or something like that. And I would suggest that the connection is not a straight line. It's not a simple one-to-one -one kind of connection, the way engineers approach it, the way the mouse was designed or something like that. I always used to say years ago, can you imagine John Coltrane trying to make the music he does on a you know, three-button mouse or something <laughs> like that? So, so, but th because the, 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 the way you're taught in engineering, especially computer engineering, um, is that you know, the, the interface should be simple, it should be easy, should, everybody should be able to do it. And when you look at the history of musical instrument making, there's no real evidence that musical instruments are simpler than they used to be. <laughs> They sometimes have, a, have achieved a certain kind of uh, streamlinedness, you might say. They, they make it easier for you to play because they make it so you, like Indian players, they have to cut the little pieces between their fingers so they can stretch the holes to play bansuri. And we, of course, adjusted that by placing little ligatures where you can use a piece of metal to stretch your finger. So that's, that sort of easiness is there. But the thing is, it's not, the flute is not easier to play than it was thousands of years ago. And just think about, I mean, the flute's a perfect example. Actually, when Christine and I were giving a talk at Newcastle, this is where this sort of talk started up. We were thinking about, about flutes, and we said, I think we called the talk how to make a flute out of a stone or some, something crazy like that. But, the, you know, the flute, the flute is such a complicated instrument because depending on the angle that you take to it, you get a different instrument. So if you play it like this, it's a, you know, it's one kind of Chinese or Indian or, or French flute. If you play it as the angle changes, you change genre of music. So you have, at this angle, you <laughs> have nays, and straight on, you have whistles and uh, recorders. And of course, there's little details. But the th thing is that this small, tiny little bits of physical difference and, and geometrical difference totally changes the instrument. And if you design an interface with 
without this kind of openness of possibility, you've kind of denied it having a musical future, in a sense. Because it's just going to be like I had when I was a kid. You, you end up with these little tricks for getting over the problems of playing instrument. When I was like six or seven years old, they gave me a ukulele. And then somebody else gave me a trick for playing the ukulele. It was something you could screw onto the ukulele. So instead of using a ukulele, say really complicated chords, usually two fingers, but two or three fingers, you'd push one button on this interface and it would, little pieces of felt would play the chords <laughs> for you. Nothing, you know, nothing like that has ever really caught on <laughs> for musical instruments. But, and yet, when I go to conferences of instrument makers, meaning like technologic, technological people trying to sell stuff to you, you know, the air guitar kind of people, they really think that people want something that will just play music really, really easy. Well, they already have that. They have like M plague players and CD players. You push one button, you get the music. They actually don't want that. It's like, imagine going to a, a, a conference of skateboard makers and bringing out your automatic robotized, you know, self gyroscoping, no, never fall over a skateboard that no one is ever going to buy, right? Because the whole point of skateboards is falling down, right? It really is. I mean, the, if you just watch them and just count how many times they fall down, it must be that's what they really like best, right? <laughs> But it isn't. It's because of the risk-taking. And I think there's a risk-taking, you might say, um, some, somebody once described improv music as like, or jazz as audible risk-taking. I don't know who said that and what the context is, but it's a beautiful phrase, audible risk-taking. And the thing is, if you make interfaces in which there's no risk, there's no reason it's ever going to become a musical instrument. So the inside-outness, in, in this case, is a kind of way for me to say that the geometry is complicated and not what you expect. Because inside out always like is like something's wrong with your brain. You don't get it. You know, like so. What, what would be an inside out trombone? Impossible to imagine. Except maybe Erfan is going to show something. But, uh, <laughs> how am I doing for time? A few few seconds. Um, let's see if I covered. Yeah, I think the gestural thing, I like to think of it really abstractly, which is that a musical, because a computer musical interface, I think of it as a kind of swipe, and swipe is a gestural word, like swipe, you, know, you do a swipe, you swipe something. I don't actually know where swipe comes from, but, but I think of music, electronic music as, as revealing to us, because of the parameter aspect, because of the technical aspect, that we can think of music as a complex, multi-dimensional, geometrical universe, a higher dimensional space of all these possibilities of connection. It's even higher if you start including gestural spaces, because then it, I know I don't want to hurt your brains too much, but we'll just stick to the idea that there's this huge dimension of possible settings of all of our parameters in some way. And the musical instrument is a way to swipe through those settings, to be able to access the settings in ways that are less um, complicated than spending all your time turning, turning zillions of knobs. And um, so, I mean, I'm not solving your problem. I'm just trying to suggest that the problem is a lot more um, rich than the engineers would suggest to think of it as a sim simple problem of, of um, connecting buttons and knobs. Um, and then there's this other issue, which I think was really evident last night. It's about the way in which a musical instrument has to own the sound that comes out of it. Whatever you think of the music or the sound that you heard, there's a way in which these guys were quite good at making it seem like they were making music. Whether the sounds were samples or wherever, it was their sound that was kind of remarkable. Even in music I really didn't dislike, there was, I mean, it really didn't really like in some way or found questionable in some way. I was still convinced by their playing of it that they had found a way to own, let's call it own, this kind of Hollywood word, I guess. But, but, uh, but it's important. It's, it's, a, it's the reason keyboard players are in the back of the band these days, right? When you go to a concert, Whatever it is, whether it's, you know, it's, it's just that no one's really interested in the way a keyboard player approaches the sound. I don't know why. I, don't, I, mean, I, I mean, I love keyboard players. There's a lot of fabulous keyboard players in the audience tonight. And I have no problem with keyboardism when it's, but it, maybe it's because the sound of a contemporary, say, pop musician keyboard is not the sound of a piano, but it's the sound of God knows what, anything, okay? And there's a way in which there's a disconnect in our, belief system in our gestural recognition system because you can't recognize what the keyboard player is doing and anything that's happening in the sound. And so what these guys last night were doing was obviously investing themselves in somehow owning the, the gestural reality of the sound that was coming out of them. Like I say, no matter whether it was an acoustic sound, like in the case of the shamanistic performance with, with heartbeats and things like that, where the sound was a very present, real, 
or other guys were using samples, so, so just recordings, which you could just push a button, but somehow making the sound that was in there not just seem like it was real, but be real for them. And I think that's a really important aspect to instrument making. How do you, how do you make your instrument own the sound that comes out of it? So I'm going to cut myself short because I, I'm the director. So um, I want to pass the, bon the baton now to uh, <laughs> an instrument maker. Erfan Abdi is from the, the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague, just finished a master's degree there. And during the last year and a half or so, he's uh, made a, a rather interesting instrument. Do you want to talk about it or do you want to just show it or how do you want to do it? Okay, I'll talk afterwards. You can.
Thank you. I wonder what Francis Bacon would have said of that instrument. <laughs> Seems to be an instrument of wonder for sure. Well, uh, if you want to know how it works, I first demonstrated the movements a bit, but it's basically uh, about rotations, about axes, uh, and measuring rotations of each arm on the next one with pot meters and sending it to uh, software that I made in processing and you can see that each rotation corresponds to one uh, way of moving the lines and that is uh, not uh, that, that is absolute control it's not about adding or uh, subtracting uh, and there's also the element of changing things in different time scales so I can either have things change abruptly or I can have a time delay sort of a, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and there are also these yellow lines and it's all based on intersection between these two types of objects. Uh, so where they intersect, you probably figured it out, but it's about the pitch, the x-axis, and the y-axis is the har harmonic frequency, and of course there is this band this other dimension of sound. Well, of course, there's this panning effect as well. And uh, yeah, wherever there is a connect intersection between the lines, there is a sound for each point. And I think that's about it. Uh, if somebody would like to try it out, I can give it to you for some short time. If there is time for that, yeah, it's it's it, it, it is this issue of complexity. In other words, we like we we like complexity. Human bodies like complexity. I don't think I em emphasize that enough. But there's a sense in which if you touch this and hold this, it's totally intriguing and it's wonderful to play and to figure out the things out. The wonder is that we like to participate in things. We don't want to have them explained to us. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, maybe we have one volunteer who is the demo. <laughs> David, you want to do this, or anybody? Uh, anybody wants to play the? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. In Frankfurt, we we with Frankfurt Ballet, we we made a piece in which the issue of the first encounter with a musical instrument is is part of the significant heart of the piece. Okay. Yeah. You can figure out what does what. It's like with the like buttons this. and yeah. You put your thumb on this. And okay. we have another fader here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, let's try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have some? I'd like to open this up to a quick discussion. We're, we're kind of pressed for time, but uh, does anybody want to comment on any of the things that have been said or talk to Erfan? Or, yeah. yeah. I had a question corresponding to your, you know, 
movements which you make with your hands mm -hmm. and those kind of visual gestures. Uh, what is your orientation point? I mean, how, you, how do you make them? You, you more feel it like this or you look what you do geometrically? Well, it's a combination of both because uh, I tend to think a bit with my eyes while I'm playing because I know what could happen if I go, for example, that direction. But also there are certain gestures that I need to learn in order to be able to do them fast enough to have that specific gesture. So it's a kind of combination. Okay. But you, you started out graphically. The very yeah. first idea was graphical. And then at some point you decided you really wanted to touch it in some way. Huh? Yeah. Get away from the keyboard can, and track. Can you describe a little bit how that process evolved? or how did, how did Sure. You, I can show you a very short demo of my previous uh, software, mm -hmm. how I started. It's... Oh yeah, this is the first software that I made. I was interested in the two-dimensional space, how I can have a dynamic notation, and how to interact with it. So I had a number of points moving in space in a certain behavior. They just followed each other, and I was trying to listen to them. So can we have sound, please? So up and down is the frequency, not the pitch. It's distributed linearly. person who could play it because I knew how the keyboard and trackpad worked and mm -hmm. I couldn't play it good enough as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was too much too slow for me in a way. Uh, but and yeah, after uh, uh, unfortunately I didn't bring my small prototypes of oh, the yeah, yeah. sticks. But it went through lots of yeah chopstick prototypes. Yeah. <laughs> barbecue, what do you call it? Shashlik. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but <laughs> but there, there must have been a certain point at which you decided that you wanted to control the events rather than have them just happen by themselves. Because at a certain point you grabbed and made a, a kind of bow or a striker or fingers. Or something like well, that. that happened throughout the process because mm -hmm. I was thinking about how much control I can have over the parameters. There's mm -hmm. another example which is dealing with less control but more uh, it's like very easy interaction with the same principles of sound. And just, what I'm doing is drag and drop with the mouse. Uh, and yeah, change the speed of these movements. So this was another try that I made mm -hmm. in the process. One step forward was to even eliminate this just to have one button to interact with. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a demonstration of how birds flock. And I just added an, this sound uh, correspondence to it. And my interaction with it was to just push the button and ch it will change the behavior Disturbance. of the birds. Yeah, so disturbing. that will change the sound as well. Uh, this was the least amount of control that I could have over the generation of sound and image. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it showed me something that I don't have to really think about everything at the moment, mm -hmm. but on the algorithms that I made, but not in every case, because, uh, well, uh, this was going on for itself, no matter if I was standing behind it or not. Mm -hmm. But the lines, I really had to uh, play with them mm -hmm. to get the sounds that I wanted. So uh, I still have this kind of... Uh, leaving some part of the music uh, generation to the computer, but mm -hmm. it's based upon some algorithms that I can see what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I have the overview all over short-term and long-term events, mm -hmm. but I choose in between them. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess uh, that, if you put it in uh, lit crit talk, that's kind of the issue of agency, of wanting to give some power to the outside world, the stuff that's outside you, the materiality, whatever it is, as well as having your own initiation, your own, your own agency. And maybe that's a deep question. Maybe we should talk about that at another time. But uh, <laughs> that's that's one of the. I mean, that's one of the reasons we do electronic music is because we we really believe somehow that this world is alive, right? That we want to give value to. We think that it's got something to say to us. And it's interesting that in the, the history of metallurgy, in the middle 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 American history, the history of the Mayan Indians, they only discovered metals around 700 A.D. 
So we have a much more recent uh, history. We know more about how a culture related to this. And what they did is they changed their cosmology. They, re they re rewrote the history of the, their Bible, you know. And, uh, and they had the gods decide to make us out of metals because of the reciprocity, because of the fact that metals speak back. In other words, they tried, God made us out of dust and made us out of mud and made us out of things, and it never was really satisfying. And when he found a way to make us out of metal, he was happy because then, like, like all religions, because then the God has somebody to talk to and we, we worship him and give him a lot of attention. And that idea that, that, um, that in the material world is, is alive is something that music continues, but other parts of our culture has, have had problems with. We tend to objectify the world and turn it into something purely exploitable. Uh, what I find quite interesting in the, in the history of science is this incredible tension between sort of what are so-called mechanical systems, which are models trying to explain what's happening, uh, in which essentially uh, matter is lifeless and it needs an impetus to put it into motion. And then you have what I would call the musical model, which uh, it links very closely with vitalism in the sense that you believe in an inner principle and the ensoulment of beings and um, other natural bodies, so there's a continuum throughout nature. And um, even though um, we think of N Newton as very sort of um, you know modern in his outlook for example I mean he had ended up believed in this vital principle uniting life forces and everything uh, and it recurs uh, you know shifts from more towards a more romantic view mm -hmm. away towards a more sort of uh, mechanistic -y view and that still goes on today mm -hmm. yeah. it's paradoxical that it's the romantics who have this me mechanistic separation or have the consequence of theirs that the world becomes more an object, more uh, in inert for them. Mm. Yeah, that's really strange. Strangely, <laughs> anybody have any comments? This is a open situation. Turn the lights up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just talk about intuition. Talk about intuition. Talk about it. Haven't we been talking about it? Yeah. Well, well for me, the, I feel like there's been a lot of reductionist sort of models mm -hmm. presented. And it, uh, well, the, for me, intuition is not about the touchy feely side. It's more about the fact that I think that we know, in music, we have this knowledge of quantity. That, that it's, an, it's an example of how incredibly precise and how incredibly refined is our, our knowledge of, of counting, of time, of measuring degrees. And it's something that isn't just, a, you know, it isn't something only in music. It's, it's how we get around the world. It's how we get down the street, how we, how we play ball, how we ride bicycles and all those kinds of things. And that, that kind of intuition is the kind that I'm most interested in. I, it's not so much a kind of mysterious, you know, magical intuition. I think it was interesting because maybe this magic word that's coming up mm. during this kind of rational time, this hyper, you know, this acceleration of rationalism, does the magic connect directly to this idea of trying to keep alive something about the actions in nature that are being lost as things become mechanized? Yes, there's, a, there's actually a, a, a continuous theme of a, a lot of movements that are interested in the magical position and try to revive it is because there's a feel of loss of some kind of essential truth about the nature or the world and so on. And there's often a sort of claim that, that, that you're reaching back and making more authentic uh, uh, music or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever you're doing. Uh, but uh, what I would say about the intuition, I mean, on the one level, yes, it's right that um, once you have internalized various bodily and uh, cognitive skills, you can improvise or, you, you know, you, f you have a, the, f what, the flow and everything and the sense of uh, doing things intuitively. I mean, what, we also have to turn it around and look at it the other way. And so certainly within, say, Western music has been uh, a significant controlling mechanism in terms of disciplining the body, in terms of what kinds of dance uh, were developed uh, and kinds of, of rhythms and so on, because in the making of music, we're internalizing a certain sense of, of, of rhythm also and pitch and so forth. So I think, again, there's this, what I would call an interplay between mm -hmm. those states. Really. Well, uh, no, I just I, I was just thinking about the role of gestures in this in this sense of the intuition and magic, and uh, I adhere more to the French school.
school of gestures, uh, Cavalier and Châtelet, the, the, uh, these guys, then the, uh, the American candidate and so on, because uh, the Americans see gestures as a special sign system, just as a semiotics. Hmm. You know, they just convey a given meaning, uh, whereas the French, they say that the gestures generate uh, signs and generate meaning. They're, they're kind of pre-semiotic things. So I think this is extremely important because they, they don't follow a logic, they make it. They make spaces, they're kind of the generators. And I think this is kind of a magic mm. thing in the sense of it doesn't follow something given, you know, reproduce something, but it's kind of the generator. And uh, Cavalier, this French mathematician and philosopher, he said that uh, comprendre, c'est attraper le geste et savoir continuer. So you're understanding means catch the gesture and, and continue. Not Mickey Mousing, mm -hmm. but continue. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a pre-semiotic situation which generates a lot of things and uh, it's not just a reproductive system. So I think when musicians start making gestures, mm -hmm. um, they are really making time. Mm. making in the sense of generating and also space. Can I add something about what you said about this um, playing an instrument which is seemingly one dimensional mm -hmm. but it has ma many more dimensions. I think this is a very interesting topic when you uh, see a pianist right, uh, you know, they say what, what this is something trivial P playing the piano essentially is just pushing the keys, you know so, so why are they making all these strange movements and <laughs> The, the point is that you can, of course, uh, the, the mechanical thing is really as, as simple as that, but you cannot connect the different sounds that you are making, the, the melodies and all these things, if you are not making a coherent gestural kind of uh, a, a dance. Uh, otherwise, you play bad, you know. It's got going down. It's like a dancer. If you reduce the dancer to the steps when he steps down or she steps down, this is not dancing. Dancing is a connection of these things. And this is a, a dancing thing. So from that, I, hmm. I think it, it's interesting to look at the Japanese no theater, the traditional theater, you know, where the stage is in fact an instrument because there are three drums below the stage and when the shita, the main actor, comes, stamps on the, on the floor, he, he's, he's a drummer. Hmm. Right? So that means the stage is an instrument, and I would reverse that. I would say every instrument should be a stage. <laughs> a violin should be a stage where you dance, and that's where it happens, you know. So when you have your trombone, you're dancing on the trombone. Mm. And when you play piano, like Cecil Taylor said, he is imitating the dance the sleeps. The dancers, yeah. So he doesn't need a score. This stupid score is com completely mm -hmm. superfluous, I mean, essentially. Yes, so I think that's extremely important to understand this mm -hmm. whole magic as a dancing action. Mm -hmm. and, and the sound which comes out is, of course, in, important, but it's just a part of it, right? <coughs> that's why you go to concerts. I'm sorry. Yes, I have been to ICMC uh, productions for 10 years. It's dead, everything, <laughs> the same shit, you know, there's somebody with a CD, and then it's completely dead. This is not what we want. Yeah. Sorry, it's just stupid stuff. I have to say, it can be complex in kind of how it has been made, mm. but what you eat at the end is horrible. So I think the dancing is really, I mean, you know, that's a human thing. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, I, I like the also the pre-linguistic idea as well because I, I really think that our knowledge of quantity of time, that you know, in other words, in order to do these jumping, you have to be able to make measurements of time. And I, that's a very abstract way to put it. You do measurements of time. But it's impossible to represent quantity in language. You can represent it in mathematical languages, but it's still not exactly the same thing as experiencing it. Our sense, yeah? Oh, sorry. Oh. You're just gesturing madly. The <laughs> microphone. Oh. So wondering if that wasn't the body of the performer connecting the sounds that are coming out of the instrument and in, in how we perceive that the instrument owns the sound. What's well, a tricky thing? I mean, clearly last night you could see there are different ways in which people were putting the sound into a device and yet somehow owning that device and the relationship to the device. And other people were it was their body was the sound, and yet. That wasn't the music. The music wasn't just a heartbeat or something like that. The music was the testifying, that, that presence of that person, the magical perceptions of that person. 
and it's very hard to tie down. And that's, that's the problem for engineers, because engineers really like things to be very cut and dried. They want to, because basically engineers don't usually meditate on the problem except as a as a as an obdraft, you know, as a commission. They're saying, "Well, here's this. I want you to be, make it possible for me to shake this bottle from remote control or something. I want somebody in the internet to be able to shake this bottle." And um, th that's not the situation for a, a musician or an artist because they have to create the whole world for you. They have to, and they have to make you believe in their world. And, uh, I, d I can't explain how to do it. I mean, everybody has to have a solution of their own. That's the thing. That's what owning is. Is a personal word. You kept using the word local, and I, th I believe very much a believer in local knowledge. We, we've been we've been convinced. We've been kind of Cartesianized by 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 the last few hundred years of of philosophy and science into believing that there is a kind of universal science. There's a kind of universal logic. There's a kind of universal mathematics. But in fact, every mathematician you talk to has another mathematics. <laughs> and there may be universals, but we haven't got access to them. Maybe God does, or something like that. If, if. but. Um, but I believe that there is a what we should emphasize, and what Stein clearly emphasized, the idea that there there are these individual points of intelligence. They're they're called artists, so they're called musicians, and that they have a unique and individual consciousness. And the amazing thing is, is that we can relate to these people. In other words, we as not them somehow are able to get into what they're doing. That that's the miracle of music: the fact that that we can cross these subjectivities. And uh, the belief in the past was that you know that they were all participating in a single universal you know Pythagorean reality. And I really don't believe in that. I think if you read the history of the Pythagoreans, it's a really interesting, interesting idea of refitting history to fit the facts. But I really don't believe that's the world we live in. I don't think that's the world we live in. We're we're all aliens in this world. You know, if you think about the way in which neurological research is revealed just in the last 10 or 15 years, our brains are all different. So we're all we're all aliens to each other in some sense. We have different machinery. We aren't inside our brain is not a Turing machine or a sequential state machine or some other kind of universal logical computer or something like that. What's inside our brain is a really complicated thing which is different in every case. Each of us have a different one because of the different experiences, the different kinds of experiences we had, and the different cultures we come from and things like that. I, think, it, um, yeah. I think something we mustn't lose sight of though, I mean we've been talking about uh, music as a sort of embodied practice, but it's also a sort of social and, and often political act as well. Mm, um, and if we're not, uh, I think we have to keep this in mind when we're thinking about both the making of it and collaboration between people because for example, I mean we're talking about on the one hand you were separating a bit uh, engineers away from the musicians mm. and I think some of the most exciting uh, developments historically have come out when there's been a small group of people who've got distributed set of skills and they in interact with each other and a mm. new synergy coming out uh, but what rapidly happens then is the reifying of sort of somehow one of them has ends up developing the power and the rhetorical strategy to be the creator person while the others are sort of left to be mere instrumentalists or something like that so so anyway it's, it's just something that That's we true. should we should be keeping in mind in our models of the, of mm -hmm. the world yeah, but there are many sources of this power. I mean, sometimes it could be an extraordinary virtuoso, a Paganini, or mm. somebody who suddenly changes an instrument in a way that everyone has to respond to. Everyone has to be another Paganini. Or it could be a king or an emperor who decides, like in the case of Louis XIV, decides mm. how music and dance should be for mm. everybody and forbids Italian music. <laughs> Familiar. <laughs> So we're getting kind of late, but I'm enjoying this conversation. So, but we have a, another session at one. So, so you only have a half an hour for lunch. But uh, I don't know. We could continue talking with sandwiches or something. <laughs> oh, it's a two. Oh, okay. Then I'm not as worried. Okay, it's a two o'clock. So, so. So uh, uh, the other session is planned for 12:30. One, we have a lunch concert. The whole point of the lunch concert is. That <laughs> so we're not uh, the, the next session in this room is at two thirty. Two thirty, yeah. But the so the group is distributed that. now. Yeah, well, thank you for coming early in the morning. It's early for me. <laughs> okay, so see you see you next session. <laughs> <laughs>